You know, to us, evangelism and discipleship isn't just like one hour a week meeting with them and doing a Bible story or going through a scripture. To us, it's, it's spending life with them. It's living with them, being there with them, and then sharing scripture with them, keep sharing the truth with them. come to the city from the villages, they immediately are looking at in the face of the reality that they're invisible in the city. So the women are out there begging on the streets and people are walking by them constantly. They don't see them, they don't even acknowledge them, they don't talk to them. And so I think God's really opened up a door for us to come into their lives and see them. So we see their needs. We don't look at them as some invisible person or some number or some project. We look at them as made in God's image and people that deserve to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So we started a project to help us gain access to the Embarrassed people. And this project helps them provide jobs and it gives us a reason to be among them and spending time with them so that we can share the gospel with them. So there's one lady that we met through our ministry and she's really a leader among the community and we were able to start meeting with her and her family and start sharing the Bible stories with her. We would go visit her every week and we've just been faithfully sharing with her for over three years and finally about two months ago she decided she wanted to give her life to Jesus and we were able to baptize her in her community in front of the whole community and she's able to testify what God has done in her life. The hope would be one day to be able to see Embera missionaries be sent out to their villages and share the gospel, share the God stories with people so they can have enough information to follow Jesus. We just want to thank you all for giving to the Lottie Moon offering because without that we wouldn't be able to do what we do. We're able to focus on our ministry. We don't have to worry about raising support and we're able to really just dedicate all of our time to sharing the good news with people who have never heard. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I am Colin White. I'm your Deacon of the Week, and uh, we're glad to see everybody here. Uh, and if you're watching with us online, um, like and comment, and I don't know, do all the things that make it um, make people see it more. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I've got I don't I don't know buttons. Uh, and so. Uh, and so uh, I've got a few announcements, just a few here. Um, the first one that I was asked to mention, you know, the, we do have Christmas cards in this little room over here. If I know that a lot of people are used to seeing it out here, but it is over there. So uh, go go get yours and uh, or if you're like me and forgot them, whatever. Uh, and so it's, just, it's true. And so anyway, uh, the, the next announcement is uh, we are still accepting uh, – donations there for our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We just saw the video here. Um, so uh, prayerfully consider what, you know, the Lord has for you to give there to, the, to that wonderful ministry. And um, uh, the last thing I was going to mention is that the WOM is still working on their Sanctity of Human Life Sunday Mission Project. So that's in your bulletin. So there's a lot there. Um, so uh, please kind of read what they're they're looking at there. So uh, we want to care for those in, in our community, and this is a great way to do it. So I'm going to uh, kick us off with a prayer and then get off the stage. Uh, dear Lord, um, 
we're we're a week away. Uh, it's a uh, what a wonderful time this year uh, to celebrate you you coming and, and living among us and just just being here. Uh, I I pray that as we we move closer and closer to Christmas that we we keep ourselves focused on that piece and not not the administration of all the other things that we're doing. Lord, I pray that uh, you just you just work the, the miracles that you're going to work in our heart and, and bring us to, to celebrate you more every day. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Uh, the praise team has got a song we'd like to share with you before, before we enter into some congregational singing. And it's a song that I'm sure most of you have heard before, but it's That Little Baby. <laughs> oh, the voices of children. They remind us that our Savior came first as a little child. Now, right after they're born, we don't know what our own children will become. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, knew for a fact that her son would grow up to be the long-awaited Messiah. An angel had told her who he would become, and she believed it with all of her heart. Though she didn't know exactly how Jesus would save the world, she seemed to be certain that God's plan for his people rested upon the sleeping newborn that lay before her. That little baby he was, born of a virgin he was, sent down to save us and to bear every burden he was, God in the flesh so let the hallelujahs ring, that little baby is a king. That little baby he was, born of a virgin he was, sent down to save us and to bear every burden he 
why don't y'all stand with us as we sing a couple of what I hope to you are familiar Christmas carols. Praise team has got one more song to share with you.
shine so bright Reminds us of the joy of this blessed holy night Hear the bells ring, hear the angels sing Glory, hallelujah, to the King Glory, hallelujah, Children's Church, and you can meet your leaders right here in the kids' corner. They did such a good job last week with the program. It was a blessing and heard so many positive comments about that. Thank you to all of our workers who worked so diligently with the children to get them ready for that program. It was wonderful. It is always a joy to be part of a local church at Christmas time because it's just so special to anticipate the celebration of Jesus' birth together. And it has been a joy to be doing that with you this season and to this evening at 6 o'clock, of course, will be our candlelight service. And so we'll be gathering here in the sanctuary uh, to sing some songs, read some scripture, partake of the Lord's Supper, and then we will have a brief time <laughs> outside with our candles. I know I was glad to hear the excitement in your voices as you talked about that this evening and the preparations you were making for uh, your gloves and your hats and all that. And I'm excited to do that outside as a testimony to our community that we want to let our light shine for Jesus. And looking forward to that time, looking forward to partaking of the Lord's Supper together. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Luke as we continue our journey through the book of Luke. Uh, as we said several weeks ago, we're going to be a little, we're a little bit off when it comes to the, the Christmas story. In January, we'll be going through the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, but that'll be okay. Uh, we, we're just doing what the Lord wants, and we're going to go verse by verse through the book of Luke. And so two weeks ago, uh, we started at Luke chapter 1, verse 5, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and their son, John, who would be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And it's a blessed story. So would you stand with me as we read that passage again? Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife's wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were, all, were well along in years. When his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. There will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. How can I know this? Zechariah asked the angel. For I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen, you will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them. Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary, he was making signs to them and remained speechless. When the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. She said, The Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. Dear Heavenly Father, today... Would you do this for us? Would you reveal to us the answer to our prayer? Lord, would you provide for us a way of rescue, a way of hope, a way of release, of relief? Whatever we are in need of today, Lord, would you provide it by your Spirit and through your Word? In the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated. When we began this passage a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Zechariah and his position. He was a priest, and because of that role, a couple of weeks out of each year, he would journey into Jerusalem from the outskirts where he lived, and he would fulfill the duties that he was called to. In this particular trip, as the lots were cast, it was him who was chosen by the providential hand of God to go into that holy place and offer up the offering of incense. Zechariah had a wife whose name was Elizabeth, and together they had been unable to have children. And for them, in their culture, in their day, that was a painful thing, just like it is for so many today. But it came with a great social stigma as well, particularly because they were of the priestly line. And they were unable to continue that line through their family. But Zechariah had a special privilege. He got to go into the holy place and to offer up that offering of incense, which was a representation of the prayers of the people of Israel going up to God. And so he went into that holy place and he lit that incense. And while he was there, all of a sudden to the right of that place, there was the angel Gabriel. The same angel that had appeared to Daniel and brought the messages to Daniel now appeared to Zechariah. For years, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth had prayed for a son. They would prayed that God would give them that lineage, that Heir, that representation of the continuation of the priestly line through them. And they had been unable to conceive, unable to have a child. And they had reached that point where Zechariah was bold enough to say what everybody else knew. He had an old wife. <laughs> Not many of us would venture to do that. <laughs> but he had gotten to that age. The facts were there. He had an old wife. He was an old man. There was no chance of them having a child. And he understood that. And that had done something to his prayer life. 
You remember Daniel, what did he pray for? He prayed for the nation of Israel. Daniel didn't pray for children. Daniel was a eunuch. He was unable to have a child. He did not have a wife. He prayed for the nation of Israel. Zechariah, unable to have children, passed that time in his life where there was hope for that to happen. His prayer had not been for the Lord to give him a child for a long time, probably. Rather, it was for the Lord to speak to the nation of Israel. 400 years of silence between Malachi and the Gospels. Israel had not heard from a prophet. They had continued as much as they were able to, as times allowed, political circumstances allowed. They continued the process of sacrifices and offerings. But there had been silence. Zechariah understood the needs of his nation, of the people. They were desperate to hear from their God. They were desperate to escape the confines of their religion and establish how God had intended for it to be a relationship where God dwelt with his people. And Zechariah was hopeful for that, and as he walked into the holy place to offer up that sacrifice, he lit the sacrifice. The incense began to burn, and as he did it, he prayed again, Lord, would you speak to your people? Would you send us that long-awaited Messiah? And as the incense burned, the smoke began to build in that holy place, and it began to rise up. And the people outside watching and waiting could see the smoke rising, and they're wondering, why has Zechariah not come back out? Why is it that the priest has gone in to light the offering of the incense, but he's not walking back out? Where They begin to get concerned. They're waiting on Zechariah to come out and offer that benedictory prayer at the end of the day, that 3 o'clock prayer time, to come out, and that they might all be sent back to their homes after a day of worship. But he does not come out. Because inside that holy place is a circumstance and a happening unlike anything anyone could have imagined. After 400 years of silence, God sends his angel Gabriel from the throne of heaven to the foot place of man to speak to Zechariah. Just as he did with Daniel, he had to fight his way here. With Daniel, he had to fight the prince of Persia in the air to get there. And with Zechariah, we don't know what it took. But 400 years of silence. And he is standing there at the altar speaking to Zechariah. Zechariah what understood what it was to wait. Do you hear me, church? Zechariah understood what it was to wait. Many of us have been in that season for a long time. What have you been waiting on? Have you been waiting on healing? Have you been waiting on peace? Have you been waiting on deliverance? Have you been waiting for circumstances to change? Circumstances you could not control. Have you been waiting on that prodigal to return home? Have you been waiting on that child to profess Jesus as Savior and Lord? Have you been waiting on God to do something fresh and new in your own heart and life? What have you been waiting on? Church, here's what I want you to know. We learn from Zechariah here that it's not about waiting. It's about anticipating. Do you hear that? If you're writing anything down, write this down. We need to go from waiting to anticipating. At Christmas time, we are anticipating that day. December 25th, it comes around every year. We know it, we mark it on the calendar, we know that there is coming Christmas Day. And we begin to make preparations for Christmas some of us year-round. Some of you are shopping for gifts year-round, looking for that bargain. Some of you are waiting to the last minute. You better get to the store quick. But we're not just anticipating gifts. We're anticipating meals and family time and celebration. We're anticipating church, candlelight services and carols, 
cookies and hot chocolate. We're anticipating all those things, children's productions that are so sweet and special. It's a wonderful blessing to anticipate Christmas. But it should be a lesson for all of us that we need to be anticipating so many other things in our life instead of just waiting. Waiting says, I hope it happens. Anticipating says, I know it will happen. 400 years, the nation of Israel had been waiting for Jesus to come. And waiting had put them in a place where they were more focused on their religion and their rituals and their habits than on the joy that a coming Savior would bring. We miss the joy of Christmas when we focus on waiting instead of anticipating. We need to put ourselves in a frame of mind of anticipating. So how does that take place? Well, we're going to pick up in these verses uh, in Luke chapter 1 with Zechariah and see the angel's response to Zechariah's prayer. So you've turned to verse 13. Well, let's back up to verse 12. When Zechariah saw him, that was the angel, he was terrified and overcome with fear. I want to tell you that I believe the reason that Zechariah was terrified and overcome with fear was because he'd been waiting instead of anticipating. He had gotten into the habit of just saying, well, maybe it'll happen. As opposed to, perhaps this is the day it will happen. As New Testament Christians, we often think the Lord, we want the Lord to come quickly. And we're waiting on the day of the Lord that he will return, but we're not anticipating. Wouldn't it be better to be anticipating that day? And then when you hear that trumpet sound, you're like, yep, it's here. Instead of hearing that trumpet sound, well, are they supposed to be testing the tornado alarms? <laughs> is it Wednesday or is it Monday? Did they change it? <laughs> we get through all those gyrations we need to be anticipating instead of waiting but verse 12 tells us that he'd been waiting and because of that Zechariah saw him and he was terrified and overcome with fear imagine a priest going into the holy place the place where God speaks to and resides with his people and being surprised to see an angel that'd be the very place I'd expect to see him if I was anticipating if I saw him at tabs that'd be a little surprising but to see an angel appear at church, that should be exciting. But he'd been waiting instead of anticipating. So the angel gives that familiar greeting that angels learn on day one of angel school. When you see a human, the first thing you say is, don't be afraid. Because they're going to be afraid. Because they've been waiting instead of anticipating. But the angel says to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. He knew his name. God knows your name, church, because your prayer has been heard. The angel responds to Zechariah first with, do not be afraid. God's answer to our prayer should not be a cause for fear. We need to be anticipating. And then he goes on to say, not just do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him John. But he also says... There will be joy and delight for you. The answer to the prayer, the response to Zechariah's prayer, an angel shows up, he says, do not be afraid, and listen, there's going to be joy. Are you happy if a prayer gets answered? Should be. The reaction to God hearing your prayer and answering your prayer should be one of joy. And you shouldn't have to be told to be joyful. But if you're standing there and you're afraid and you've been waiting instead of anticipating, you need a little more instruction. So the angel says there will be joy and delight. Why is that? I think it's very key here that we need to understand the name of this child. 
His name will be John. We understand the significance in chapter 2 when Mary is told his name will be Jesus. But there is great significance to the name John. Because that name means the Lord gives graciously. The Lord gives graciously. The nation of Israel has been waiting for 400 years. Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, who knows? And now the prayer had been heard and answered because the Lord gives graciously. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Don't forget this. For by grace are you saved. The Lord's grace is not something that we manufacture. It's not something that we earn. It's not something that we are deserving of. It's entirely of God. It's entirely what He gives us. And in response to Zechariah's prayer for a child, in response to his prayer for the nation of Israel, the Lord gives graciously. The angel responds to Zechariah's prayer and then reveals God's answer to Zechariah's prayer. It's not just that the Lord gives graciously. Look at who and what the Lord is giving here. Very clearly we see that the angel reveals that God's answer to Zechariah's prayer is found in the character and the calling of John himself. So John's character is very key here. Verses 13 and 14. Do not be afraid, your son will have the name John, and he will be a joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. Your son, who's the gift of God given graciously, is going to bring about joy and delight for many. It's not just that Elizabeth and Zechariah are going to be happy. It's that the nation of Israel is going to be happy. There's going to be anticipation among all the people of Israel because of God, John's character. Picking up in verse 15, we see that he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in the mother's womb. Verse 16, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Verse 17, he will go before them in spirit and power of Elijah. This is John's character and calling. There are many statements here about who he is. We know his name's meaning, the Lord gives graciously. The right response to that grace, joy and delight. I hope you still have joy and delight about the grace that God has shown to you. Amen. That when Jesus saved you and keeps you saved every day because there's nothing you can do to keep it, just like there was nothing you could do to earn it, it's joy and delight that is found in him. But John's Character is very particular. Great in the sight of the Lord, and he will never drink wine or beer. Now, to never drink wine or beer was one of the requirements of a Nazarite. Not having his hair cut, that was another one. There were several requirements to that, but the only one mentioned here is he will not be, drink wine or beer, no alcoholic beverage. We don't know particularly from this statement that John was a Nazarite, but we do know something very intentional about him, that there was no wine or beer to come across his lips. That's a very particular statement, but it is set apart and explained by that next phrase very clearly, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there's just a little lesson there that we need to take away that you might think, well, what does that have to do with the Christmas story? Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to save his people. And as his children, as Christians, Jesus also gave us what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. So that when you are saved, you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And by allowing yourself, well, let me say that differently. 
by being obedient to the commands of Scripture, by being obedient to God's teaching, we allow the Spirit of God to work in us and to fill us. This occurs before the giving of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. John was given the Spirit of God in the womb, and he was to be filled with the Spirit. What do we know from the New Testament? You can't be filled with the world and filled with the Spirit at the same time. This is just another biblical example about how when we allow the things of the world to come into us, there's, we take away room for the Spirit of God to be working in us. We need to understand that. So that would not be in him. John's character was that he was averse to the things of the world. Anything that the world said was good, John says, uh, I don't think so. When we get into the Gospels, where do we find him? He wasn't living in the city. He wasn't even living on the outskirts of town. He was living out in the hills, way outside. He was, he was out where the sunshine was brought in every other week. He was way out there. And he was wearing what? Camel hair. He wasn't wearing comfortable clothing. He wasn't wearing fashionable clothing. And he was not on the best diet. He was not eating at the Mexican restaurant once a week, getting Chinese once a week. He wasn't doing all those things that we enjoy doing. He was eating locust and honey. That's amazing to me. Do you understand the level of devotion to the calling that God puts on our life if we are truly going to be given over to doing what he's called us to do? We are living in a world where we're only willing to give this much but the biblical example is we give everything to God to be fully used by Him. And so I'm reminded here at Christmas time when I read about John and his calling that as much as I love the trappings of Christmas and the holiday, I need to be more anticipating Jesus Christ than I need to be anticipating Christmas Day. He was averse to the things of the world, but he was abounding in the Holy Spirit. His clothing, his diet were, were great representatives of what it takes to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Self-denial and self-control. That's who John was. The wine would have been destroying to his life, his testimony, and to his ministry. It would have destroyed him to have the things of the world invade him. And so he stayed away from those things that were destructive and allowed only those things in his life that were building up, filling him with the Holy Spirit. And because he was averse to the things of the world and because he abounded in the Holy Spirit, he was attractive to those who were looking for more. Verse 16, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. When you get into the Gospels and you see the work of John the Baptist, he didn't come into town to tell them what was going on. They went out to find him. He was attractive to those things of the people of the world. He said that those who were living in the religion of the day, those who were filled with their own ideas instead of being filled with the Spirit of God, they came out and they sought him which fulfills, make a note of this, and you can look at it later, Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. John and the person that he was, his calling and his character, was a fulfillment of Scripture. It says that he would turn the unwise to wise and turn the disobedient to obedient. Isn't that what we're desiring in our own lives? We want wisdom in our life. We want obedience in our life. If we're going to have that, we need to quit looking to the world and start looking out to where the people of God are, the men of God are, the Word of God is, and get our leading from those things. But most of all, what John would be doing, verse 17, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, when it says there, he will go before him, that is referring back to God himself, what God is doing. We need to understand that John wasn't just the forerunner of Jesus, the man. He was the forerunner of Jesus, the Savior, God with us. And so the Gabriel, as he talks to Zechariah, makes sure that Zechariah understands it wasn't that John was the forerunner of another man who was better than John. He, rather, he was the forerunner of God in the flesh. He was the forerunner 
of God himself. Verse 17 goes on to say, He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of righteousness to make ready for the Lord's prepared people. John was the forerunner of Jesus who was going to bring about a restoration of Israel. That's what we need to understand here, the restoration of Israel. Israel that had been waiting instead of anticipating. Because Israel had been waiting, they had focused on their religion rather than their relationship with God. They had focused on their rituals and habits rather than the joy that came from being God's people. There was not the national pride in the nation of Israel at this time. There wasn't the overwhelming joy that we are the chosen people of God, that we are His representatives here on earth until He comes to establish His throne. They had lost their joy. They had lost their focus on the relationship with God. Now you and I need to know that we struggle in the same way. We struggle because we think we can do it better on our own. We struggle because we think, hey, I've read the Bible, I've been to church, and now you know what? This is how I'm going to be a Christian. And you hear it in phrases like, I can talk to God just as easy in a deer stand as I can in church. And what does that lead to? A whole lot more time in the deer stand than in church. Well, you know, I, you know we, we talk about God all the time, except at church. I don't have to go to church to learn about God. I can learn about Him from other people. Listen, that's religion, not relationship. Because God gave us the Holy Spirit and the local church for a reason. There's a reason that we come together in Sunday school and in worship together because the Bible tells us we're to come together and encourage one another, to build one another up. When I'm in that deer stand, there's nobody out there to build me up. There's nobody in there to give me a sharp elbow when I start fading off during the sermon. Everybody give your neighbor a good elbow right now. Don't want anybody falling off. You, can't, you don't get that. We need the local church. Just like Israel needed to dump their religion and get a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have people in our communities, in our church family, in our own personal families that are struggling with their religion and it is dominating their lives. And they are happy to talk about how good they are with God outside of the truth of God's Word. The nation of Israel, those people knew about the calendar and when the festivals were. They knew when they needed to be at church and when they didn't need to be at church, when they had to be there and when it was optional. They knew when they needed to bring their tithes and their offering, but the rest of the time it was optional. They got into all these habits and it took them so far away from having a relationship with God. Because here's what they thought. I'm just going to wait for God to show up, and when He does, then I'll go. When He does, then I'll go and do. Well, thankfully, God sees our fallacies. He sees our wrong thinking, and He gives us the answer. He sends John as a fulfillment of Scripture to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Malachi 3, 1 says, See, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming. The closing words of the prophet in Malachi said you need to anticipate that he is coming. 400 years, they went from anticipating to waiting. But now, the anticipating begins. Because Zechariah is about to walk out of that holy place and he's about to walk out into the light where those people are standing there waiting, wondering what's taking him so long. We've seen the smoke of the incense go up. 
We've been here praying and we're waiting on him to come out and give us that benedictory prayer so we can all go home and keep on waiting for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. But Zachariah walks out. And because of his own doubt about what the angel said, he was going to be silent. No more words coming out of his lips until that son was born. It wasn't just that he was going to be silent. There was no more hearing. No more hearing what others had to say. Now many of you have said, I could just get some silence for a while. It'd be okay. If I could just be silent for a while, not have to talk. Some of your teachers are glad that you got a break from school. You don't have to be talking and saying the same thing 72 different times to 13 different kids. Zachariah was going to have that silence for more than nine months because she wasn't pregnant when he walked out of there. There was time before she, or his wife was pregnant and before that child was born. 10, 11, 12 months. Silence. Why did he need that? Zechariah needed that so that he would shift from waiting to anticipating. So that he would be prepared for that time that he had a son filled with the Holy Spirit that he was raising and caring for to send out into the ministry to do the work that he'd been called to. Later on it says that Elizabeth went away for five months when she conceived. Five months away from everybody going, no, there's no way you're pregnant. No, that couldn't be true. But when she come back after five months, the evidence was there. She was with child. And those five months she spent preparing herself to be the mother of this child and what he was being called to do. I can imagine in that time of silence in their home. There was probably the most intensive Bible study going on in their house that had ever been there. You mean we're going to be the parents of this forerunner? You mean the Messiah is coming? They needed that silence to contemplate. But for those people outside that holy place when Zechariah came out, they knew something had happened because he wasn't talking to them says that he was using his hands to communicate with them. Now what hand gestures do you think he was making to explain the fact that on the right side of the altar of incense there was an angel who said, I'm going to have a son. I don't know what he could have come up with. Charades wouldn't have worked. He didn't say four words, first word. But the people understood that something had happened. And the word spread. And the nation of Israel went from waiting to anticipating. Waiting to anticipating. Look at what it says at verse 25. This is what Elizabeth says after her husband comes home and she conceives a child. She says, the Lord has done this for me. Church, whatever you've been praying for, let's stop waiting, start anticipating, so that with Elizabeth we can say, the Lord has done this for me. At Christmas this year, stop waiting, start anticipating. Now, the Lord may not give you your answered prayer in a gift bag with a bow on it and a little bit of tissue paper. He may not give you your answer at all. But at least you're going to be obedient to Scripture and you're going to be anticipating Him to answer that prayer instead of waiting on Him to answer that prayer. So that when Christmas Day comes, and we come to church together to worship. You know why we're having church on Christmas Day? Because it's Sunday. That's the day when God's people gather together, right? Celebrate His resurrection. 
Isn't that neat? We get to celebrate his birth and his resurrection on the same day. That's why we're going to get together the next week, too. That was just an extra. Are you ready to anticipate with me, church? Whatever the Lord's doing in your heart today, I pray that you'd let him do. I've been anticipating something lately. I've been anticipating that God's going to start moving in the hearts of his people. He's going to start drawing folks at Fairview Baptist Church closer to himself than they've ever been before. I want to ask you to anticipate that with me. Anticipate that for yourself in the days ahead. But if the Lord is calling you into salvation, stop waiting to make it public and let the church know. If the Lord's calling you into ministry, stop waiting for someone else to tell you you need to come forward. Just go up and say, Lord's calling me to do something more than what I'm doing right now. Lord's calling you to join with this church. Stop waiting. Let's anticipate what the Lord's going to do together. Would you stand with me as we pray, and then we're going to sing a hymn of decision. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to see so clearly how much we need to be anticipating instead of waiting. Would you let that be done even this morning? Whatever it is that we're in need of, Lord, speak to our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn. Have thine own way, Lord. Joy to be with you today. I want to encourage you again to continue inviting folks to our candlelight service tonight as well as our Christmas Day service. We'll be worshiping together on our normal schedule at 1030. There will be no Sunday school, but we will be gathering for worship at 1030 and looking forward to that special time. Thank you for your generosity as you have been giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We're continuing to take that offering up through Christmas Day, so I want to encourage you if you haven't again given and are being led to do so that you would do that. There are offerings available for you to put that in or you can just designate it on your check as well. And then take a look in the bulletin at the project the Women on Mission are starting for the month of January uh, in regards to Sanctity of Human Life Day. They are going to be taking up items for uh, the Women's Resource Center and those are listed in your bulletin for you to take note of. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Look forward to seeing you here tonight for our candlelight and communion service. Really anticipating that with you. Let's be dismissed with prayer together. Pat, would you dismiss us please?